I have known only one person in my life who claimed to have seen a ghost. It was a woman. And the interesting thing is that she disbelieved in the immortality of the soul before seeing the ghost and still disbelieves after having seen it. She thinks it was a hallucination. In other words, seeing is not believing. This is the first thing to get clear in talking about miracles. Whatever experiences we may have, we shall not regard them as miraculous if we already hold a philosophy which excludes the supernatural. Any event which is claimed as a miracle is, in the last resort, an experience received from the senses. And the senses are not infallible. We can always say we have been the victims of an illusion. If we disbelieve in the supernatural, this is what we always shall say. Hence, whether miracles have really ceased or not, they would certainly appear to cease in Western Europe as materialism became the popular creed. For let us make no mistake, if the end of the world appeared in all the literal trappings of the apocalypse, if the modern materialist saw with his own eyes the heavens rolled up to and the great white throne appearing, if he had the sensation of being himself hurled into the lake of fire, he would continue forever in that lake itself to regard his experience as an illusion and to find the explanation of it in psychoanalysis or cerebral pathology. Experience by itself proves nothing. If a man doubts whether he is dreaming or waking, no experiment can solve his doubt, since every experiment may itself be part of the dream. Experience proves this or that or nothing, according to the preconceptions we bring to it. This fact, that the interpretation of experiences depends on preconceptions, is often used as an argument against miracles. It is said that our ancestors, taking the supernatural for granted and greedy of wonders, read the miraculous into events that were really not miracles. And in a sense, I grant it. That is to say, I think that just as our preconceptions would prevent us from apprehending miracles, if they really occur, so their preconceptions would lead them to imagine miracles, even if they did not occur. In the same way, the doting man will think his wife faithful when she is not, and the suspicious man will not think her faithful when she is. The question of her actual fidelity remains, meanwhile, to be settled, if at all, on other grounds. But there is one thing often said about our ancestors we must not say. We must not say. They believed in miracles because they did not know the laws of nature. This is nonsense. When St. Joseph discovered that his bride was pregnant, he was minded to put her away. He knew enough biology for that. Otherwise, of course, he would not have regarded pregnancy as a proof of infidelity. When he accepted the Christian explanation, he regarded it as a miracle precisely because he knew enough of the laws of nature to know that this was a suspension of them. When the disciples saw Christ walking on the water, they were frightened. They would not have been frightened unless they had known the laws of nature and known that this was an exception. If a man had no conception of a regular order in nature, then, of course, he could not notice departures from that order. Just as a dunce who does not understand the normal meter of a poem is also unconscious of the poet's variations from it. Nothing is wonderful except the abnormal, and nothing is abnormal until we have grasped the norm. Complete ignorance of the laws of nature would preclude the perception of the miraculous just as rigidly as complete disbelief in the supernatural precludes it, perhaps even more so. For while the materialist 
would have at least to explain miracles away. The man wholly ignorant of nature would simply not notice them. The experience of a miracle, in fact, requires two conditions. First, we must believe in a normal stability of nature, which means we must recognize that the data offered by our senses recur in regular patterns. Secondly, we must believe in some reality beyond nature. When both beliefs are held, and not till then, we can approach with an open mind the various reports which claim that this super or extra natural reality has sometimes invaded and disturbed the sensuous content of space and time which makes our natural world. The belief in such a supernatural reality itself can neither be proved nor disproved by experience. The arguments for its existence are metaphysical and to me conclusive. They turn on the fact that even to think and act in the natural world, we have to assume something beyond it, and even assume that we partly belong to that something. In order to think, we must claim for our own reasoning a validity which is not credible if our own thought is merely a function of our brain, and our brain's a byproduct of irrational physical processes. In order to act, above the level of mere impulse, we must claim a similar validity for our judgments of good and evil. In both cases, we get the same disquieting result. The concept of nature itself is one we have reached only tacitly by claiming a sort of supernatural status for ourselves. If we frankly accept this position and then turn to the evidence, we find, of course, that accounts of the supernatural meet us on every side. History is full of them, often in the same documents, which we accept wherever they do not report miracles. Respectable missionaries report them not infrequently. The whole Church of Rome claims their continued occurrence. Intimate conversation elicits from almost every acquaintance at least one episode in his life, which is what he would call queer or rum. No doubt, most stories of miracles are unreliable. But then, as anyone can see by reading the papers, so are most stories of all events. Each story must be taken on its merits. What one must not do is to rule out the supernatural as the one impossible explanation. Thus, you may disbelieve in the man's angels because you cannot find a sufficient number of sensible people who say they saw them. But if you found a sufficient number, it would, in my view, be unreasonable to explain this by collective hallucination. For we know enough of psychology to know that spontaneous unanimity in hallucination is very improbable. And we do not know enough of the supernatural to know that a manifestation of angels is equally improbable. The supernatural theory is the less improbable of the two. When the Old Testament says that Sennacherib's invasion was stopped by angels, and Herodotus says it was stopped by a lot of mice, who came and ate up all the bowstrings of his army, an open-minded man will be on the side of the angels. Unless you start by begging the question, there is nothing intrinsically unlikely in the existence of angels or in the action ascribed to them. But mice just don't do these things. A great deal of skepticism now, current about the miracles of our Lord, does not, however, come from disbelief of all reality beyond nature. It comes from two ideas which are respectable, but I think mistaken. In the first place, modern people have an almost aesthetic dislike of miracles. Admitting that God can, they doubt if he would. To violate the laws he himself has imposed on his creation seem to them arbitrary, clumsy, a theatrical device only fit to impress savages, a solecism against the grammar of the universe. 
In the second place, many people confuse the laws of nature with the laws of thought and imagine that their reversal or suspension would be a contradiction in terms as if the resurrection of the dead were the same sort of thing as two and two making five. I have only recently found the answer to the first objection. I found it first in George MacDonald and then later in St. Athanasius. This is what St. Athanasius says in his little book on the Incarnation. Our Lord took a body like to ours and lived as a man in order that those who had refused to recognize him in his superintendence and captaincy of the whole universe might come to recognize from the works he did here below. In the body that what dwelled in this body was the word of God. This accords exactly with Christ's own account of his miracles. The Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. The doctrine, as I understand it, is something like this. There is an activity of God displayed throughout creation, a wholesale activity, let us say, which men refuse to recognize. The miracles done by God incarnate, living as a man in Palestine, perform the very same things as this wholesale activity, but at a different speed and on a smaller scale. One of their chief purposes is that men having seen a thing done by personal power on the small scale, may recognize when they see the same thing done on the large scale that the power behind it is also personal, is indeed the very same person who lived among us 2,000 years ago. The miracles, in fact, are a retelling in small letters of the very same story which is written across the whole world in letters too large for some of us to see. Of that larger script part is already visible. Part is still unsolved. In other words, some of the miracles do locally. What God has already done universally, others do locally what he has not yet done but will do. In that sense, and from our human point of view, some are reminders and others prophecies. God creates the vine and teaches it to draw up water by its roots and with the aid of the sun to turn that water into a juice which will ferment and take on certain qualities. Thus every year from Noah's time till ours God turns water into wine. That men fail to see. Either like the pagans they refer the process to some finite spirit Bacchus or Dionysus or else, like the moderns, they attribute real and ultimate causality to the chemical and other material phenomena which are all that our senses can discover in it. But when Christ at Cana makes water into wine, the mask is off. The miracle has only half its effect if it only convinces us that Christ is God. It will have its full effect if whenever we see a vineyard or drink a glass of wine. We remember that here works. He who sat at the wedding party in Cana. Every year God makes a little corn into much corn. The seed is sown and there is an increase. And men, according to the fashion of their age, say it is Ceres, it is Adonis, it is the corn king, or else it is the laws of nature. The close-up, the translation, of this annual wonder is the feeding of the 5,000. Bread is not made there of nothing. Bread is not made of stones, as the devil once suggested to our Lord in vain. A little bread is made into much bread. The Son will do nothing but what he sees the Father do. There is, so to speak, a family style. The miracles of healing fall into the same pattern this is sometimes obscured for us by the somewhat magical view we tend to take of ordinary medicine. The doctors themselves do not take this view. The magic is not in the medicine, but in the patient's body. 
What the doctor does is to stimulate nature's functions in the body or to remove hindrances. In a sense, though we speak for convenience of healing, a cut, every cut heals itself. No dressing will make skin grow over a cut in a corpse. That same mysterious energy, which we call gravitational when it steers the planets, and biochemical when it heals a body, is the efficient cause of all recoveries. And if God exists, that energy, directly or indirectly, is his. All who are cured are cured by him, the healer with it. But once he did it visibly, a man meeting a man, where he does not work within, in this mode, the organism dies. Hence Christ's one miracle of destruction is also in harmony with God's wholesale activity. His bodily hand held out in symbolic wrath blasted a single fig tree. But no tree died that year in Palestine, or any year, or in any land, or even ever will, save because he has done something, or more likely ceased to do something to it. With Christ's own account of his miracles, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. The doctrine, as I understand it, is something like this. There is an activity of God displayed throughout creation, a wholesale activity, let us say, which men refuse to recognize. The miracles done by God incarnate, living as a man in Palestine, perform the very same things as this wholesale activity, but at a different speed and on a smaller scale. One of their chief purposes is that men, having seen a thing done by personal power on the small scale, may recognize when they see the same thing done on the large scale, that the power behind it is also personal, is indeed the very same person who lived among us 2,000 years ago. The miracles, in fact, are a retelling in small letters of the very same story which is written across the whole world in letters too large for some of us to see. Of that larger script part is already visible, part is still unsolved. In other words, some of the miracles do locally what God has already done universally, others do locally what he has not yet done, but will do. In that sense, and from our human point of view, some are reminders and others prophecies. God creates the vine and teaches it to draw up water by its roots and with the aid of the sun to turn that water into a juice which will ferment and take on certain qualities. Thus every year from Noah's time till ours God turns water into wine that men fail to see. Either like the pagans they refer the process to some finite spirit Bacchus or Dionysus. Or else like the moderns, they attribute real and ultimate causality to the chemical and other material phenomena, which are all that our senses can discover in it. But when Christ at Cana makes water into wine, the mask is off. The miracle has only half its effect. If it only convinces us that Christ is God, it will have its full effect. If whenever we see a vineyard or drink a glass of wine, we remember that here works he who sat at the wedding party in Cana. Every year God makes a little corn into much corn. The seed is sown and there is an increase. And men, according to the fashion of their age, say it is Ceres, it is Adonis, it is the corn king, or else it is the laws of nature. The close-up, the translation of this annual wonder is the feeding of the 5,000 Bread is not made there of nothing. Bread is not made of stones, as the devil once suggested to our Lord in vain. A little bread is made into much bread. The son will do nothing but what he sees the father do. There is, so to speak, a family style. The miracles of healing fall into the same pattern. This is sometimes obscured for us by the somewhat magical view we tend to take of ordinary medicine. The doctors themselves do not take this view. 
the magic is not in the medicine, but in the patient's body. What the doctor does is to stimulate nature's functions in the body, or to remove hindrance. In a sense, though we speak for convenience of healing a cut, every cut heals itself. No dressing will make skin grow over a cut on a corpse. That same mysterious energy, which we call gravitational, when it steers the planets, and biochemical, when it heals a body, is the efficient cause of all recoveries. And if God exists, that energy, directly or indirectly, is his. All who are cured are cured by him, the healer within. But once he did it visibly, a man meeting a man, where he does not work within in this mode, the organism dies. Hence, Christ's one miracle of destruction is also in harmony with God's wholesale activity. His bodily hand held out in symbolic wrath blasted a single fig tree. But no tree died that year in Palestine, or any year, or in any land, or even ever will, save because he has done something, or more likely, ceased to do something, to it. When he fed the thousands, he multiplied fish as well as bread. Look in every bay and almost every river. This swarming, pulsating fecundity shows he is still at work. The ancients had a god called Genius, the god of animal and human fertility, the presiding spirit of gynecology, embryology, or the marriage bed, the genial bed, as they called it after its god, Genius. As the miracles of wine and bread and healing showed who Bacchus really was, who Ceres, who Apollo, and that all were one, so this miraculous multiplication of fish reveals the real genius. And with that, we stand at the threshold of the miracle, which for some reason most offends modern ears. I can understand the man who denies the miraculous altogether. But what is one to make of the people who admit some miracles, but deny the virgin birth? Is it that for all their lip service to the laws of nature, there is only one law of nature that they really believe? Or is it that they see in this miracle a slur upon sexual intercourse, which is rapidly becoming the one thing venerated in a world without veneration? No miracle is in fact more significant. What happens in ordinary generation? What is a father's function in the act of begetting? A microscopic particle of matter from his body fertilizes the female, and with it microscopic particle passes, it may be, the color of his hair and his great-grandfather's hanging lip and the human form in all its complexity of bones, liver, sinews, heart and limbs and look human form which the embryo will recapitulate in the womb. Behind every spermatozoon lies the whole history of the universe. Locked within it is no small part of the world's nature. That is God's normal way of making a man, a process that takes centuries, beginning with the creation of matter itself, and narrowing to one second and one particle at the moment of begetting. And once again, men will mistake the sense impressions which this creative act throws off for the act itself or else refer it to some finite being, such as genius. Once, therefore, God does it directly, instantaneously, without the spermatozoon, without the millenniums of organic history behind the spermatozoon. There was, of course, another reason. This time, he was creating, not simply a man, but the man who was to be himself, the only true man. The process which leads to the spermatozoon has carried down with it, through the centimes, much undesirable silt. The life which reaches us by that normal route is tainted. To avoid that taint, to give humanity a fresh start, he once short-circuited the process. There is a vulgar anti-God paper which some anonymous donor sends me every week. In it I recently saw the taunt that we Christians believe in a God who committed adultery 
with the wife of a Jewish carpenter? The answer to that is that if you describe the action of God in fertilizing Mary as adultery, then in that sense, God would have committed adultery with every woman who ever had a baby for what he did once without a human father, he does always, even when he uses a human father, as I, his instrument. For the human father, in ordinary generation, is only a carrier, sometimes an unwilling carrier, always the last M.A. long line of carriers, of life that comes from the supreme life. Thus the filth that our poor, muddled, sincere, resentful enemies fling at the Holy One either does not stick or sticking turns into glory. So much for the miracles, which do small and quick what we have already seen in the large letters of God's universal activity. But before I go on to the second class, those which foreshadow parts of the universal activity we have not yet seen, I must guard against a misunderstanding. Do not imagine I am trying to make the miracle less miraculous. I am not arguing that they are more probable because they are less unlike natural events. I'm trying to answer those who think them arbitrary, theatrical, unworthy of God, meaningless interruptions of universal order. They remain, in my view, wholly miraculous. To do instantly with dead and baked corn what ordinarily happens slowly with live seed is just as Greek a miracle as to make breed of stones just as Greek but a different kind of miracle that is the point when I open Ovid or Grimm I find the sort of miracles which really would be arbitrary trees talk houses turn into trees magic rings raise tables richly spread with food in lonely places ships become goddesses and men are changed into snakes, or birds, or bears. It is fun to read about. The least suspicion that it had really happened would turn that fun into nightmare. You find no miracles of that kind in the Gospels. Such things, if they could be, would prove that some alien power was invading nature. They would not in the least prove that it was the same power which had made nature and rules her every day. But the true miracles express not simply a God, but God, that which is outside nature, not as a foreigner, but as her sovereign. They announce not merely that a king has visited our town, but that it is the king, our king. The second class of miracles on this view foretell what God has not yet done, but will do, universally. He raised one man, the man who was himself, from the dead, because he will one day raise all men from the dead. Perhaps not only men, for there are hints in the New Testament that all creation will eventually be rescued from decay, restored to shape, and subserve the splendor of remade humanity. The transfiguration and the walking on the water are glimpses of the beauty and the effortless power over all matter which will belong to men when they are really waked by God. Now, resurrection certainly involves reversal of natural process in the sense that it involves a series of changes moving in the opposite direction to those we see. At death, matter which has been organic falls back gradually into the inorganic to be finally scattered and used, perhaps, in other organisms. Resurrection would be the reverse process. It would not, of course, mean the restoration to each personality of those very atoms, numerically the same, which had made its first or natural body. There would not be enough to go round for one thing. And for another, the unity of the body, even in this life, was inconsistent the slow but perplexed change of its actual ingredients. But it certainly does mean matter of some kind rushing toward organism as now we see it rushing away. It means, in fact, playing backwards a film we have already seen 
straight forward. In that sense, it is a reversal of nature. But, of course, if a further question whether reversal in this sense is necessarily contradiction. Do we know that the film cannot be played backwards? Well, in one sense, it is precisely the teaching of modern physics that the film never works backwards. For modern physics, as you have heard before, the universe is running down. Disorganization and chance is continually increasing. There will come a time, not infinitely remote, when it will be wholly run down or wholly disorganized and science knows of no possible return. From that state, there must have been a time not infinitely remote in the past when it was wound up, though science knows of no winding up process. The point is that for our ancestors, the universe was a picture, but modern physics is a story. If the universe is a picture, these things either appear in that picture or not. And if they don't, since it is an emelmite picture, one may suspect that they are contrary to the nature of things. But a story is a different matter, especially if it is an incomplete story. And the story told by modern physics might be told briefly in the words, Humpty Dumpty was falling. That is, it proclaims itself an incomplete story. There must have been a time before he fell, when he was sitting on the wall. There must be a time after he had reached the ground. It is quite true that science knows of no horses and men who can pill him together again, once he has reached the ground and broken. But then she also knows of no means by which he could originally have been put on the wall. You wouldn't expect her to. All science rests on observation. All our observations are taken during Humpty Dumpty's fall because we were born after he lost his seat on the wall and shall be extinct long before he reaches the ground. But to assume from observations taken while the clock is running down that the unimaginable winding up which must have preceded this process cannot occur when the process is over is the merest dogmatism. From the very nature of the case, the laws of degradation and disorganization which we find in matter at present cannot be the ultimate and eternal nature of things. If they were, there would have been nothing to degrade and disorganize. Humpty Dumpty can't fall off a wall that never existed. Obviously, an event which lies outside the falling or disintegrating process, which we know as natural, is not imaginable. If anything is clear from the records of our Lord's appearances after his resurrection, it is that the risen body was very different from the body that died and that it lives under conditions quite unlike those of natural life. It is frequently not recognized by those who see it and it is not related to space in the same way as our body. The sudden appearances and disappearances suggest the ghost of popular tradition, yet he emphatically insists that he is not merely a spirit and takes steps to demonstrate that the risen body can still perform animal operations such as eating. What makes all this baffling to us is our assumption that to pass beyond what we call nature, beyond the three dimensions and the five highly specialized and limited senses, is immediately to be in a world of pure negative spirituality, a world where space of any sort and sense of any sort has no function. I know no grounds for believing this. To explain even an atom, Schrodinger wants seven dimensions, and give us new senses, and we should find a new nature. There may be natures piled upon natures, each supernatural to the one beneath it. Before we come to the abyss of pure spirit, and to be in that abyss at the right hand of the Father, 
may not mean being absent from any of these natures, may mean a yet more dynamic presence on all levels. That is why I think it very rash to assume that the story of the Ascension is mere allegory. I know it sounds like the work of people who imagine an absolute up and down and a local heaven in the sky. But to say this is after all to say. Assuming that the story is fake, we could thus explain how it arose. Without that assumption, we find ourselves moving about in worlds unrealized, with no probability or improbability to guide us. For if the story is true, then a being still in some mode, though not our mode, corporeal, withdrew at his own will from the nature presented by our three dimensions and five senses, not necessarily into the non-sensuous and undimensioned, but possibly into or through a world, or worlds of supersense and superspace. And he might choose to do it gradually. Who on earth knows what the spectators might see? If they say they saw a momentary movement along the vertical plane, then an indistinct mass, then nothing. Who is to pronounce this improbable? My time is nearly up and I must be very brief with the second class of people who I promise to deal with. Those who mistake the laws of nature for laws of thought and therefore think that any departure from them is a self-contradiction like a square circle or two and two making five. To think this is to imagine that the normal processes of nature are transparent to the intellect, that we can say why she behaves as she does. For of course, if we cannot see why a thing is so, then we cannot see any reason why it should not be otherwise. But in fact, the actual course of nature is wholly inexplicable. I don't mean that science has not yet explained it, but may do so someday. I mean that the very nature of explanation makes it impossible that we should even explain why matter has the properties it has. For explanation, by its very nature, deals with a world of ifs and ands. Every explanation takes the form, since A, therefore B, or if C, then D. In order to explain any event, you have to assume the universe as a going concern, a machine working in a particular way. Since this particular way of working is the basis of all explanation, it can never be itself explained. We can see no reason why it should not have worked in a different way. To say this is not only to remove the suspicion that miracle is self-contradictory, but also to realize how deeply right St. Athanasius was when he found an essential likeness between the miracles of our Lord and the general order of nature. Both are a full stop for the explaining intellect if the natural means that which can be fitted into a class, that which obeys a norm, that which can be paralleled, that which can be explained by reference to other events, then nature herself as a whole is not natural. If a miracle means that which must simply be accepted, the unanswerable actuality which gives no account of itself but simply is, then the universe is one great miracle. To direct us to that great miracle is one main object of the earthly acts of Christ that are, as he himself said, signs. They serve to remind us that the explanations of particular events which we derive from the given, the unexplained, the almost willful character of the actual universe are not explanations of that character. These signs do not take us away from reality. They recall us to it, recall us from our dream world of ifs and ands to the stunning actuality of everything that is real. They are focal points at which more reality becomes visible than we ordinarily see at once. I have spoken of how he made miraculous bread and wine and of how 
when the Virgin conceived. He had shown himself the true genius whom men had ignorantly worshipped long before. It goes deeper than that. Bread and wine were to have an even more sacred significance for Christians, and the act of generation was to be the chosen symbol among all mystics for the union of the soul with God. These things are no accidents. With him, there are no accidents. When he created the vegetable world, he knew already what dreams the annual death and resurrection of the corn would cause one to stir in pious pagan minds. He knew already that he himself must so die and live again, and in what sense, including and far transcending the old religion of the corn king. He would say, this is my body. Common bread, miraculous bread, sacramental bread, these three are distinct, but not to be separated. Divine reality is like a fugue. All his acts are different, but they all rhyme or echo to one another. It is this that makes Christianity so difficult to talk about. Fix your mind on any one story or any one doctrine, and it becomes at once a magnet to which truth and glory come rushing from all levels of being. Our featureless pantheistic unities and glib rationalist distinctions are alike defeated by the seamless yet ever-varying texture of reality, the liveness, the elusiveness, the intertwined harmonies of the multidimensional fertility of God. But if this is the difficulty, it is also one of the firm grounds of our belief. To think that this was a fable, a product of our own brains as they are a product of matter, would be to believe that this vast symphonic splendor had come out of something much smaller and emptier than itself. It is not so. We are nearer to the truth in the vision seen by Julian of Norwich when Christ appeared to holding in his hand a little thing like a hazelnut and saying, this is all that is created. And it seemed to her so small and weak that she wondered how it could hold together at all.